Hi, I'm going to discuss our paper on fast rates for non-parametric online learning. And this is joint work with Kostis Daskalakis. There's been a couple of common themes in modern machine learning. Uh, and one of these is the use of large or non-parametric function classes, such as uh, those given by neural networks. And often these are things that are uh, very non-convex in their inputs. The second theme that's, that's been occurring is that there's a lot of multi-agent settings in which there's multiple agents interacting in the setting of the game. And the goal is to find some equilibrium in this game. And one prevailing question that kind of relates both of these questions is how do we find equilibria in the sorts of non-convex and large games that arise uh, as we, uh, in, in modern machine learning? And there's been a lot of work on this question. And in the past, uh, there's been many uh, papers which have studied local notions of equilibria. But unfortunately, issues such as non-existence of equilibria, as well as computational intractability, have led to significant obstacles. And in this paper, we're going to take another perspective uh, in, towards, uh, in, in terms of addressing this question. And this perspective is, is the very classic fact that no regret learning implies convergence to, to global equilibria. And for instance, this would be convergence to Nash equilibria and two player zero sum games. Now, uh, results showing regret bounds and also convergence to equilibria have been very common in the last several decades. But we're going to look at a slightly different type of question than that, which is uh, typically investigated, which is how quickly can we get convergence, uh, say, of regret in large or non-parametric games? In order to do so, uh, we're actually going to have to consider uh, the setting of adversarial online learning, in fact, uh, some, prove some fast rates uh, for that setting in order to get uh, convergence rates for learning in games. So I'll begin by discussing our results on learning with an adversary. And then I'll discuss uh, some applications to learning in games. So let's begin with the basic setting of online regression in the adversarial setting. Let's fix the space X, which can be thought of as a space of covariance, and a hypothesis class big H, consisting of hypotheses or functions which map from X to zero one. In the setting of adversarial online regression, there is a uh, uh, given number capital T of time steps. And at each time step little t between one and capital T, the following happens. There's two players, a learner and an adversary. And at time step t, the learner will choose a hypothesis ht mapping from x to zero one, perhaps at random. And the adversary will choose a pair xt, yt, consisting of a, uh, a covariate or feature xt and a label yt. The learner and the adversary then reveal their choices to each other. And the learner then suffers a loss which is the distance between the prediction ht at the adversary's point uh, xt minus yt. So we're gonna consider a couple of different types of learners. A proper learning algorithm, is a learner learning algorithm that produces hypotheses ht that belong to the class big H. And an improper learning algorithm is one that has no such constraint. And either side in the learning algorithm's goal is to minimize its regret which is simply the expected value of the difference between the algorithm's aggregate loss and the best possible loss the algorithm could have uh, achieved in hindsight by using a single fixed hypothesis over all t rounds. So one important special case of online regression, in fact, a special case which is uh, useful for analyzing uh, the general case of, of online regression is what's known as the realizable setting. So this is a setting where the adversary is constrained to choose examples x, t, y, t, which are consistent with the hypothesis class big H in the sense that there exists some hypothesis H star belonging to H, which correctly labels all uh, examples x, t, y, t chosen by the adversary. And in the realizable setting, the regret simply becomes what's known as the cumulative loss or mistake bound, which is simply the expected value of the learner's loss over all t time steps. And in this special setting, uh, several decades ago, Littlestone established a characterization of the optimal mistake bound in the case that the class big H is binary valued. 
So what he showed is that for binary valued hypothesis classes, H namely where all the hypotheses and then take the values zero and one, there is a simple improper learning algorithm known as the standard optimal algorithm or SOA, whose cumulative loss is equal to the Littleston dimension of the class H. And moreover, this is optimal in the sense that there's no algorithm which can achieve uh, better uh, cumulative loss or mistake bound against an adversary. Now, I'll define what the Lowstone dimension is in a moment. It's a combinatorial quantity which uh, characterizes on the learnability of hypothesis classes. Before doing so, I'm gonna uh, ask a couple of questions about this, this result. So, so one question is what about real valued hypotheses? Um, Littlestone's work really only resolved the case for binary valued ones and really uh, you know, many uh, types of extensions of this result are open for real valued classes. And the second natural question is whether it's possible to make the uh, learning algorithm proper. This turns out to be very important for applications, including our own application of learning in games. And there's a little bit of progress uh, on this question by Hanek and Livni Moran um, last year, but they only treated the case of binary hypothesis classes. So in order to discuss our results, which do address both of these questions, I'll begin by making a couple of definitions, including the definition of the Lowstone dimension. So given a real valued binary class, a uh, real valued hypothesis class H consisting of, of real value uh, hypotheses, for positive alpha, we define the alpha sequential fat channel dimension of H denoted by S fat alpha of H to be the largest positive integer D so that there exists a tree of depth D which is alpha shattered by the class H. Now, what does that mean? A tree of depth D simply, uh, that's alpha shattered, is simply a combinatorial representation of the strategy of the adversary, which can force the learner to make at least D mistakes of size alpha. Um, I'll refer the, uh, to our paper for, for a formal definition. But roughly speaking, classes which have larger such trees are those which are harder to online learn because there's more things the adversary can do to fool the learner. Now it's a basic fact that the sequential fat channel dimension at scale alpha is a non-increasing function at alpha. This is because making alpha smaller makes it easier for the adversary to force the learner to make a mistake and therefore making alpha smaller makes the sequential fat channel dimension larger. Finally, for binary hypotheses classes H, we'll define the Littlestone dimension of them to be the sequential fat channel dimension at scale zero. Okay, so for such binary classes, this SOA, as I mentioned before, provides the optimal loss bound of Littlestone dimension. Now there's a straightforward generalization of the SOA, which I'll call the single scale SOA, and that gives the loss bound shown here. It's the inf over all scales alpha of this quantity. And this is a folklore result. Um, it's, it's very straightforward. Our main result is to get something that's better than this. What we show is that for real valued hypothesis classes H, there exists an improper learning algorithm that is cumulative loss at most this quantity, which is similar to the folklore result above, except S fat alpha of H is replaced with an integral over S fat eta at all scales eta between alpha and one. Now, this difference can actually be pretty substantial. For instance, if the sequential fat channel dimension scale alpha grows with one over alpha, then the first of these bounds, the folklore result, uh, gets root t, but R bound is log t. Also mentioned that our result is tight up to a factor of log t in the sense that there exists a hypothesis class such that any algorithm uh, cannot improve by our bound by more than a log t factor for that hypothesis class. However, an instance dependent characterization in the sense that Littlestone showed for uh, binary classes remains open in, in the case of real value online learning. So I'm next going to discuss the proof of, of this theorem. And the proof involves some fairly simple ideas. Uh, but to do so, I first need to tell you how the folklore result, namely this single scale SLA learner works. So I, I restated the folklore result at the top. And um, he, he, here's how the algorithm works. First of all, for any subclass G of the hypothesis class H, for any positive alpha and uh, covariate X, we define SOA G alpha of X to be a real number. It's gonna be a real number J, which is a integral multiple of alpha, 
either zero, alpha, two alpha, all the way up to one. And this J is chosen so as to maximize the sequential fat gender dimension of the subclass of G consisting of those hypotheses, which are up to an error of alpha equal to J. Now, the single scale SOA algorithm uh, at the scale alpha works as, as follows. Uh, first, we set G to equal H. And then for each time step T, we're gonna predict the mapping HT, which maps X to SOA G alpha of X. After making that prediction, we see the adversaries uh, uh, pair XT, YT. And if it's the case that we make a mistake of size larger than alpha, namely if YT minus SOA G alpha of XT is bigger than alpha, we're going to restrict G to the set of all hypotheses, which are within alpha of YT evaluated at the point X. And note that our choice of SOA G alpha of X is made so as to ensure that that restricted set is, uh, has sequential fat gender dimension as large as possible. Okay, now this single scale algorithm, uh, as, as, as is evident, uh, works at a single scale alpha, namely we fix alpha at the beginning of the algorithm. The key to improving upon the loss bound is to actually work over multiple scales at once. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose scales alpha one through alpha L, uh, namely by de decaying powers, inverse powers of two for L equal to log T. And what we're going to do is find a way to aggregate instances of the SOA hypotheses at each of these scales alpha L for L between one and, 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 and log T. And the way we do this aggregation is via a new hierarchical aggregation rule that we define. And here's how we define it. Uh, given real numbers Y1 through YL between zero and one, we define their hierarchical aggregation, HAGG of Y1 through YL to be the value of YL star, where L star is chosen so that, first of all, for all L at most L star, the distance between consecutive labels YL and YL minus one is at most two times the scale alpha L minus one. And finally, L star satisfies YL star minus YL star plus one is bigger than two times alpha L star. So this might be a little bit confusing. It helps to work out an example. So let's consider the case where capital L is four. We have Y1 through Y4 distributed as is shown here on the real line. Now it turns out that L star is actually three here. Why is that? Well, the distance between Y1 and Y2 is at most one. The distance between Y2 and Y3 is at most a half. The distance between Y3 and Y4 is a bigger than a quarter. And therefore this second condition, the smallest L star for which it is satisfied is, is L star equals three. And that's why L star is three here. So at a high level, the hierarchical aggregation rule tells us how to do the following. Given the outputs of say single scale SOA learners at each of L scales, it tells us how to choose one of those outputs and declare that as the learning algorithm's output. And that intuition is really kind of all you need to understand uh, the learning algorithm that allows us to prove this theorem. So what we do is we're going to initialize uh, hypothesis classes G1 through GL all to the hypothesis class H. And at each time step T, our multi-scale learning algorithm is going to predict the mapping HT of X, which is the hierarchical aggregation of SOA G1 alpha one of X through SOA GL alpha L of X. So it's just aggregating the outputs of single scale learners. And then once we see the adversaries uh, pair X T Y T, we're going to update each of these classes G little L, which makes a mistake on X T Y T of size larger than alpha L. And it turns out that this really simple algorithm uh, is all we need to prove our main uh, cumulative loss bound for an improper learning algorithm. Now, the hypotheses that we output are quite complicated. They involve the hierarchical aggregation rule and these SOA hypotheses. In particular, this learning algorithm is improper. And what about proper learning algorithms? These are those which require that the hypotheses HT of the learner belong to H. Can we show a similar loss bound for proper learning algorithm? 
immediately it's not clear if doing so is possible because perhaps surprisingly in many settings, proper learning is actually harder than improper learning. Um, but we actually do need a proper learning algorithm for, for our setting um, because in the setting of learning and games, proper algorithms correspond to those which choose valid actions. The good news is that we actually can get a randomized proper learning algorithm, which actually achieves cumulative loss bound, which is at most what we had for the improper setting times a polylogarithmic factor in T. And this holds against any realizable adversary. So in a sense, proper learning is almost as easy as improper learning in this setting. Now this theorem is a fairly substantial improvement upon prior works. The best prior bound, even for binary classes, was on the order of the square root of Littlestone dimension times T. Um, our randomized proper learner achieves a mistake bound of Littlestone dimension times log of T to the six for the case of binary classes. And now we marked that also randomization is actually necessary to achieve any sublinear mistake bound for proper learning. Okay, so how do we construct this, this online proper learner? The high level idea is to combine, to combine an algorithm uh, by Hanagi, Livni, and Moran, which studied a similar problem in the case of uh, uh, proper, for proper learning in the binary value case. And we wanna combine that with our hierarchical aggregation rule, which as I mentioned a few slides ago, achieves a uh, cumulative loss bound for improper real value learning. Now, there's many technical challenges here. Um, and one of them is the fact that Hanukkah Lili Moran's bound does not get this little stone dimension times poly log of T bound that we're able to get in the binary setting. So one key innovation or algorithm is to use an algorithm which is essentially doubly multi-scale in some nature. Another technical challenge that we have is that we need a proven minimax theorem for real valued function classes. And I'll discuss that later on in the talk. Um, overall, our algorithm is quite complicated. Uh, you can see our paper uh, for full details. On it. But next, I'll discuss some extensions of our main result, which are useful for our application for learning and games. Uh, one extension is actually an extension of our one extension of our of our main result puts additional constraints in the learner. So we're going to say that a proper learning algorithm is eta stable if the consecutive hypotheses that it outputs ht and ht plus one are distributed according to distributions with total variation distance at most eta. Here eta is a positive real number. What we show is that we can actually make our eta stable proper learning algorithm, uh, we can make our proper learning algorithm eta stable with a loss, with a uh, decay in the cumulative loss bound of a factor of one over eta. So in particular, we have uh, a cumulative loss bound, which is at most one over eta times the bound that we had for proper learning. And once again, this holds under any realizable adversary. The strategy to prove this result is actually very simple algorithmically. The algorithm simply consists of averaging the most recent one over eta consecutive hypotheses output by the learner uh, from the previous slide. Unfortunately, proving, this work is, proving that this works is significantly more challenging. Uh, in general, averaging does not work to get this decay in cumulative loss, which scales as one over eta. And in fact, we have to do a much more careful analysis of the explicit construction of our proper online learner. So stability turns out to be a key property uh, for proving the second of our two extensions, which in turn is useful uh, for our application for learning and games. This extension actually works in a non-realizable setting, which is the generalization of the realizable setting where there's uh, the adversary does not have to choose examples which are consistent with a single hypothesis. And in this setting, we aim to minimize regret as opposed to cumulative loss. So what we show is that in the setting of a binary value hypothesis class, there is a randomized proper learning algorithm, which is T to the minus one fourth stable, such that if the adversary satisfies the constraint, that their consecutive examples are t to the minus one, four, minus one fourth closed in a certain sense. And the learning algorithm's regret scales as t to the one fourth times a polynomial in little stone dimension. So here we're essentially relaxing the constraint in the adversary in some sense. And we're proving a somewhat weaker bound for the regret 
previously for binary classes, we had a log t type bounds. Now we're getting poly t. But the key point is that t to the one fourth is better than the typical worst case adversarial bounds on square root of t. Now the proof of that idea of this theorem consists of using the stability of the proper learners together with some standard results about path length regret bounds for the optimistic hedge algorithm. Previously, no such uh, regret bounds were known for infinite or non-parametric games, and our result is, is the first uh, result of that nature. Now, why do we care about this theorem? Well, it turns out that we can use it to prove fast rates for learning in games, which I'll proceed to discuss uh, in the, on the next few slides. But the idea behind why this is possible is that in the setting of learning in games, each agent will be using this randomized proper stable algorithm. And by stability, the strategies of the other agents will lead to examples xt and xt plus one, which are t to the minus one fourth close for any given fixed agent. And that allows us to apply this theorem and thereby uh, conclude a, a fast regret bound of t to the one fourth. So having said that, let's uh, take a step back and uh, introduce the setting of learning in games. So consider a two player zero sum game with infinite action spaces. You can think of these action spaces as say all possible weights of a neural network or something in the setting of GAMS. One question we might exist is what we might ask is uh, do Nash equilibria even exist for such games? We know they exist for finite games, what about infinite ones? Second is uh, if Nash equilibria do exist then at what rates do no regret algorithms converge to them? It turns out that under a fairly natural compactness assumption, which actually guarantees existence of equilibria, prior work has already determined the optimal adversarial regret for non-parametric online learning. And for many classes, say for instance, binary value classes, the rates here scale is root t, which is what is expected. But it's very natural to ask a third question, which is that if we use, can we use the fact that all agents are playing a game simultaneously in order to show faster rates, namely rates that are less than square root of t. So as the second question here is essentially already resolved, we're gonna focus on the first and the third. Unfortunately, the first question has a negative answer, at least without any qualifications. Nash equilibria may not exist in infinite games, for instance, for the game, guess the larger number. This is the game where there's a max player and a min player, so there's a two player zero sum game, and uh, their action spaces are indexed by the set of natural numbers, and the winner is simply the player who guesses the larger number. Uh, we break ties in favor of, say, the max player. And it's a standard fact that this game has no approximate Nash equilibrium, even for a constant approximation. But a remarkable fact shown by Haneke, Livni, and Moran uh, last year is that this guess the larger number game is the only obstacle to having approximate Nash equilibria, at least for binary valued games. Uh, more formally, uh, what they showed is that if an infinite binary game has no subgame, which is isomorphic to guess the larger number, then this game has epsilon approximate Nash equilibria for all positive epsilon. Now, of course, the natural question is which binary games actually meet the assumption in this theorem? A sufficient condition is those with finite little stone dimension. I've already defined little stone dimension for hypothesis classes, but not games. I will do so uh, for games in the following slide. Uh, but for now, I'll just note that this condition of finiteness of little stone dimension is almost necessary in a certain sense uh, for infinite binary games to not have subgames which are guessed a larger number. So what we show is that uh, there's a real value generalization of this result. In particular, if an infinite real valued game is no subgame, which is epsilon close to some affine transform of guessed larger number, then it has order epsilon approximate Nash equilibria for all positive epsilon. Now also remarks that both of these theorems have a converse, which requires a, a mild technical condition of uniform convergence. So essentially what we give is we give a characterization of when the minimax theorem holds in the real valued setting. And this generalizes the result uh, by Hanekin and Moran for the binary valued setting. Okay, so in order to state our main result for learning in games, I have to tell you a, a couple of definitions, in particular, what's the little stone dimension in binary games. So consider a binary valued game G, which has M players and where each player I has action space AI. Uh, 
we're going to assume that the players have binary losses. So the loss of uh, player i denoted by li takes as input an action profile and outputs zero or one. And in the setting of learning and games, each player chooses their action AIT each time step T according to some algorithm. And then their loss is given by LI of the agent's actions at time step T. Now, this setting of learning games has been studied extensively for the last couple of decades, but most or almost all of these results uh, assume that the action spaces are finite and give bounds in terms of say the size of the action space. If the action spaces are instead infinite or extremely large, how do we measure complexity? How do we say how hard a game is in this setting? The idea is to view each player's action space as their hypothesis class as follows. For each player i, we define hi to be the class of functions which map a minus i to the loss function li of ai a minus i. And this class is indexed by actions ai. And given this, we can define we can consider the Littleston dimension of the hypothesis classes HI, and then define the Littleston dimension of the games, the maximum of each player's, uh, the maximum of the Littleston dimension of each player's hypothesis class. It turns out this, this, this is actually a very convenient uh, complexity measure for learning in games. And therefore, a natural question is, is there some no regret learning algorithm such that if all players use it in a game of finite Littleston dimension, can they all have regret, which is little o root t. By the standard uh, regret bounds for learning in classes of finite Littleston dimension against an adversary, we know that players can get regret scaling as a constant uh, times root t times root Littleston dimension. But we're asking if we can do better in terms of dependence on the, uh, on the time horizon t. Now our answer is essentially yes. What we show is that there is a no regret algorithm such that if each player uses it, then their regret scales as t to the one fourth times Littleston dimension is the three fourths, even in general sum binary games. The main thing to note here is that our uh, result has no explicit dependence on the number of actions, uh, unlike all prior work, which gets fast rates for learning in games. And there the dependence always scales the logarithm of the number of actions, so because that's an upper bound in Littleston dimension, we're always improving upon prior work in that sense. And as an immediate corollary, we get the standard results uh, uh, as follows. Uh, we're able to show that um, the empirical averages of each player's iterates get a t to the minus three fourths approximate Nash equilibrium in two player zero sum games. And the empirical averages of players' joint strategy profiles approaches a t to the minus three fourths approximate CCE in general sum binary games. Okay, so finally, uh, I'll conclude. Um, one big uh, gap in a lot of, uh, one big uh, uh, downside to a lot of our results is that they're purely statistical in nature. We don't give computationally efficient algorithms. Um, and in fact, that's out of necessity for the sorts of global equilibrium computation questions we're considering. There's very strong ha computational hardness results for finding, uh, for finding global e equilibria. But it's possible that we could hope to find, uh, say, sublinear regret bounds in an oracle efficient way. There are strong negative results along this question against an adversary for proper learning. There are some positive results for smooth on learning. I think a, a more thorough investigation of this question is a really interesting direction for future work. Uh, it's also interesting to improve some of the polynomial or logarithmic factors in our bounds. And finally, you can find our paper on archives shown here. Uh, thank you for listening.